there's been a bit of a U-turn in hydration advice for athletes over the last 100 years. This has been clearly documented by Professor Tim Noakes, Ross Tucker and Jonathan Dugas from the University of Cape Town. Their research into hydration concluded that, in the early 1900s, it was considered best practice to advise athletes to drink nothing or as little as possible during all athletic pursuits. They highlight a quote from James E. Sullivan, head of the Amateur Athletic Union from 1909. Don't get in the habit of drinking and eating in a marathon race. Some prominent runners do, but it's not beneficial. Fast forward 50 years, and the advice hadn't really changed much. In the 1960s, Tour de France rider Tommy Simpson's trainer said, Four small bottles for a long stage of the tour. It's frowned upon to drink more. Avoid drinking when racing, especially in hot weather. Drink as little as possible, and with the liquid not too cold. It's only a question of willpower. Then things started to change. 1965 was the year that Dr Robert Cade came up with the first iteration of the sports drink that eventually became known as Gatorade. It was developed to combat the fatigue that the University of Florida football team, the Gators, suffered in the oppressive heat and humidity that Florida is famous for. The hypothesis was that this fatigue was often being caused by a combination of carbohydrate depletion, dehydration and electrolyte loss. So a drink formulated with sugar, salts and water was developed and found to be remarkably effective. Gatorade got off to a great start commercially, was named a sponsor of the NFL in 1969 and has been used to wash the hair of football coaches ever since. Rising sales led Gatorade's marketers to promote the positive benefits of drinking and increasingly highlight the dangers of dehydration. In 1985, the Gatorade Sports Science Institute was set up. Its stated mission is to help athletes optimise their health and performance through research and education in hydration and nutrition science. In the 80s and 90s, GSSI conducted studies into the effects of dehydration on performance. Many of these studies appeared to demonstrate that dehydration was a serious performance limiter, especially during endurance sports in the heat. And, over time, this message gradually became established as fact within the sporting community. This reached its height in 1996 with the American College of Sport Medicine's Position Stand on Exercise and Fluid Replacement. It included a statement, During exercise, Athletes should start drinking early and at regular intervals in an attempt to consume fluids at a rate sufficient to replace all the water lost through sweating or consume the maximal amount that can be tolerated. The movement from nil by mouth to consume as much as can be tolerated is one of those classic pendulum swings in the world of sports science. Other examples include the high carb versus low carb diet debate and cushioned or supportive running shoes versus barefoot running. These polarisations tend to occur because human brains love simple answers and either-or, black or white debates. We struggle with grey areas, even though that tends to be where the answers to complicated questions often reside. Professor Tim Noakes was among the first to question whether the drink-drink-drink philosophy was really a good idea. He uncovered a growing number of cases of hyponatremia, a sometimes fatal condition characterised by low blood sodium levels, in an increasing number of endurance athletes who had seemingly followed advice to drink as much as they could. Noakes went on to write a thoroughly researched and emotionally charged book called Waterlogged, The Serious Problem of Overhydration in Endurance Sports. In this, he suggests that hyponatremia has become a significant problem largely because of the marketing efforts of the sports drink industry. He makes the tragic point that there have been a number of preventable deaths from overdrinking, and that these could have been avoided with more balanced messaging. It's impossible to argue that the sports drink industry has not been influential in overemphasizing the dangers of dehydration. This counter-argument has definitely started to have an impact. In 2007, the American College of Sports Medicine, updating its guidelines, said, The goal of drinking during exercise is to prevent excessive dehydration or more than 2% body weight loss, and excessive changes in electrolyte balance to avert compromised performance. Because there is considerable variability in sweating rates and sweat electrolyte content between individuals, customised fluid replacement programmes are recommended. Individual sweat rates can be estimated by measuring body weight before and after exercise. This was definitely a significant step away from drink as much as tolerable but its correctness and practical usefulness to athletes has still been challenged.
Noakes and his supporters cite numerous examples of world-class performances occurring when dehydration has exceeded 2%, sometimes by a significant amount. Like when marathon runner Haile Gabri Selassie lost almost 10% of his body weight during a 205.29 marathon winning performance in Dubai in 2009. Data collected on large numbers of Ironman finishes in New Zealand and South Africa shows that most of the field ended up significantly dehydrated at the finish line and that some of the faster finishers were in fact some of the most dehydrated of all, losing in the region of 2-7% of their body weight. This kind of evidence, along with real-world experience from endurance athletes, suggests that an arbitrary 2% dehydration limit is neither useful nor correct in all scenarios. The truth is significantly more complex and seeking a simpler one-size-fits-all solution can be counterproductive. Noakes' current theory is that athletes simply need to drink water to the dictates of thirst in order to avoid hyponatremia, whilst maintaining sufficient hydration levels for survival and the maintenance of performance. This theory has won a lot of support in recent years. He argues, quite compellingly, that the human body is designed to optimise its own hydration levels, so... If you drink to thirst, that is basically all you need to know about hydration. End of story. This approach has merit in many circumstances. It's likely to be compatible with the main goal of avoiding over-drinking for most people in normal situations. But it's also yet another oversimplification in the field of hydration marketing, as it's unlikely to be true for all athletes, all of the time. There's evidence that a pre-planned hydration strategy may be more effective for those engaging in very high intensity, medium duration endurance events, where maintenance of blood volume is critical to support very high levels of performance. One reason drinking water to thirst might not always work is because sweat contains relatively large and quite variable levels of electrolytes, so prolonged sweating can deplete the body of these finite reserves. This is most likely to be the case during ultra-distance events, where total sweat losses can be significant over a long period of time, especially in the heat. Maybe because of the human tendency towards tribalism, there are currently two opposing camps in hydration science. There's those who back the drink water to thirst argument, and those who are proponents of a drink to a plan approach. As is so often the case, when considering two completely opposing ideas, it's a good idea to look for the middle ground for clues as to where the truths are likely to be found. So where is the middle ground? Here's what 2016 Ironman 70.3 world champion Tim Reed has to say. Drinking to thirst is likely to be a good approach in day-to-day -day life or endurance training completed at very low intensity. But in my opinion, it's a terrible approach for those looking to maximise their performance in endurance events. My thirst response doesn't really kick in until I've already lost one litre of fluid or more. While that shouldn't drastically affect my performance, I still continue to lose far more than I replace after my thirst response has kicked in, and so inevitably have to slow my speed as my blood volume continues to decline. When drinking to thirst, I can lose 4 to 4.5 kilograms in a 2 hour run, leaving my heart rate very high and my performance very lethargic. During a race, my thirst response is even more subdued due to my fight or flight system running on overdrive. Perhaps there are athletes whose thirst response provides a more reliable guide, but in my experience, with both coaching and racing, drinking to a schedule, particularly in the first half of events, leads to vastly better performance outcomes. So, at the sharp end, it seems that opinion is moving towards a view that, whilst drinking to thirst is a sensible approach for shorter or lighter activities, during very long events in the heat, when total sweat and electrolyte losses are high, replenishment might need to be approached more proactively than would be the case in shorter bouts of activity. Other scenarios where a pre-planned but flexible approach might be beneficial include during moderate duration high intensity activities where the maintenance of blood volume to assist cardiac output, heat dissipation and other metabolic challenges is very important. During days and weeks of back-to-back -back hard or high intensity training or competition in hot conditions, where cumulative sweat losses have the potential to cause stepwise depletion in fluid and electrolyte levels in the body. When individuals have exceptionally high sweat sodium losses and need to be more aggressive with replacement protocols to balance those out. When the athlete is inexperienced and all of the sensations associated with pushing their bodies very hard are relatively new and difficult to interpret accurately. 
In environments where opportunities to access fluids are limited or constrained, for example, during a soccer match, and where drinking at certain times and abstaining at others can be tactically advantageous, such as in bike racing or long distance triathlons. In the next few modules, we're going to take a deeper look at exactly what goes wrong if an athlete does significantly over or under drink.